today's speakers. So Molly West Duffy leads organizational development at Rally and was previously an organizational design lead at the global innovation firm IDEO. She, she's worked with companies of all sizes to develop good workplace culture. Her writing has been featured in Fast Company, Quartz, Entrepreneur, Quiet Rev, and other digital outlets, and she's taught design courses at Stanford and USC. Liz Fosslein leads content at Humu, where she helps leaders and their teams take small steps towards profound improvement. Prior to joining Humu, Liz designed and led workshops for executives at Google, Facebook, and Nike on how to create inclusive cultures. Her writing and data visualization projects have appeared in CNN, The Economist, The Financial Times, and NPR. Both Liz and Molly are co-authors of No Hard Feelings, The Secret Power of Embracing Emotion at Work, and are both specialists in what it takes to embrace change in an organization. And they are here today to talk about flexible work models and the iterative mindset. So Liz and Molly, I'll hand it over to both of you. Thank Oops, you I mean, so I'm sorry, I forgot to change slides to show you who this was. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Ferrata, and thank you all for being here. We're, we're really excited to share with you and learn from you both. Um, I'm, I know we're all living in this moment of flux, so really excited to be here. So I'll let Liz take it away. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, so we'd love maybe to start off with just to get a sense of everyone who's here, if you could put your name, organization name, and then location in the chat. I know a lot of you are Bay Area based, but not everyone. Um, so really curious to get to know all of you. And like um, I think we already mentioned, this is gonna be pretty interactive. So we just really encourage you use the chat. Um, we'll also have prompts. Feel free to take yourself off mute at that point, um, whatever you feel comfortable, however you feel comfortable sharing. Okay, so it looks like, yes, lots of Bay Area. South San Francisco, oh, Los, I think I saw Los Angeles, New York. So we do have a spread of people. Burlingame, Redwood City, UCLA. Oh, they're coming in fast. Great. Thanks everyone for sharing. So it does look like, yeah, primarily Bay Area, but we do have some of you, Portland, um, spread out across the country. So super curious to hear all of your perspectives today. Um, Los Angeles, great. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, excited to get to hear more from all of you later on. So um, Rada already did a great job of introducing us, um, but just for a little more context, I am in San Francisco. I am a Bay Area commuter. I've done it all. I've biked, I've ride shared, I've ridden public transportation. I've driven, uh, driving is my least favorite. So super into the mission of getting fewer cars um, on the road. Uh, and also to give you context, um, at Humu we work with a range of organizations and we send employees at those organizations nudges to help them uh, improve at work and improve the teams around them. So we have visibility into what big companies like um, Ford and Unilever and Vodafone are doing uh, and how they're thinking about the return to work eventually. Um, so, you know, happy to answer questions and really, really curious to hear what all of you have to say. We were talking before this call about how the future of flexible work is such a question mark. Um, so we're all kind of figuring out together. And then Molly, anything to add or we can keep moving? I know we did intros Let's already. Keep Great. So this is our book. Um, no Hard Feelings it came out about two years ago, all about embracing emotions at work. Uh, and we have found, especially over the last year, we've just had like an influx in inbound requests. I think it's been a tough year. There's been a lot of uncertainty, anxiety, um, burnout has been a big issue at a lot of organizations. So I think this is just more important than ever. Um, and the thesis of the book is essentially that we are all humans. We all have emotions. You're gonna have feelings, whether you're on a walk, watching a movie or on the job. Uh, and so given that it's actually time that we learned how to embrace those uh, as professionals at work. Um, 
And that's just much healthier than suppressing everything and then having it kind of blow out in these big shows that give emotions at work a bad name. So for our session today, we're excited to cover, we'll spend the first part looking at hybrid work model frameworks. So we'll show a framework of how you can start thinking about different models, uh, walk through some examples of what other companies are doing, and then lead, that will lead into a discussion where again, we'd love to hear from all of you. Um, and then the second half will be about an iterative planning mindset. So again, no one really has the answers here. There's a lot of uncertainty in the future. So just really important to be able to adapt, be flexible. Uh, and so we'll give some tips and guidance for how to do that and what to keep in mind over the next three months, you know, short term, medium term, and long term. So to start with some hybrid work models. So as you're thinking about having people come back to the office, uh, there's kind of two main axes um, to consider. And so the first is just flexibility. So letting people come in when they want, do asynchronous work, uh, just not having to have sort of the traditional nine to five Monday to Friday schedule. Uh, I think the past year has kind of afforded us more ability to move things around in our schedule. And some people really like that. And then maximum collaboration. So obviously if I'm working from in the mornings in San Francisco and Molly's working in the afternoons in Los Angeles, uh, we're not gonna be able to collaborate in person or even collaborate um, online as much as we would be if we were sitting next to each other in the office at the same time. So a couple models that fit into this. <clears throat> so maximum flexibility is just to give people you know, leeway, come in whenever you want, book a space, be there. Um, but you're going to lose out on collaboration there. So if I come in on Monday and Molly comes in on Tuesday, that's not necessarily that much better than each of us working from home because we didn't overlap in the office. And one of the key things to think about, and you'll see this as we walk through what other companies are doing. Um, one thing to think about when it comes to hybrid work is really focusing on being purposeful about in-person time. Um, so you do want to maximize all the things that you can't do when you're apart. So think about like onboarding, building relationships, um, making decisions quickly, having performance related conversations that might be a little more emotionally intense. Um, so that's kind of a piece of what we're talking about when we say collaboration. Um, the next is alternate days or weeks in the office. So you might have this divvy up by team, by project. Um, and that still affords people flexibility because they'll know the days and weeks when they're at home, um, but they might still have collaboration and those spontaneous collisions that tend to lead to innovation. On the, uh, maybe, you know, still giving people flexibility, but um, really uh, improving on collaboration is setting a few days a week when everyone is in the office. So this could be like, everyone comes in Monday, Tuesday, um, but the rest of the week you can kind of do as you wish. So you're still giving people some flexibility, but also having a lot of collaboration. And then finally, um, you know, you could also say like, we're back to normal. Everyone comes in four days a week, uh, or it's sort of the traditional five day a week arrangement. And there you're really maximizing for collaboration, but you're kind of taking away some of the flexibility that a lot of people have become accustomed to and have started to really like. So interesting, there's research that shows, I think, about 75% of respondents in a survey that Slack did um, said that they preferred some kind of hybrid model. So I think that probably is the future is gonna be somewhere in this fewer than three set days a week when everyone is in the office or maybe around four. So a couple of work models that we're seeing across companies, again, this is kind of uncharted territory. So. It's interesting to watch what the big players are doing and seeing how that shakes out. Um, Basecamp has been remote, even pre-COVID, they've always been a fully remote company and they do interviews in person. And then they also bring the entire team together for several week long retreats uh, in person. And we have also heard of some companies starting to think about this or at least decreasing their physical footprint. Uh, so giving up some office space and starting to think about how they could use that money instead to bring people in for retreat-based uh, collaboration, but not have this sort of like in the office every week habit. Microsoft Japan did an interesting thing where they actually tested out what a four day work week would look like. So people had one day off uh, and they found that productivity actually went up slightly. So giving people that time off to recharge was really valuable 
at my company, Humu, we also did this last year, um, sort of at the height of the pandemic. Leadership did a survey, found out that all people were extremely burnt out and just exhausted and had like so many more personal responsibilities. Some of that included taking care of their kids, homeschooling. Um, so they gave us every other Friday off for a couple months and also saw absolutely no decreases in productivity and a lot of increases in well-being. Like people just appreciated that time and still got all their work done. So really interesting to watch that space. Um, McKinsey, the consulting firm, they send employees to client locations, but they have super Fridays where everyone is required to be in their office. So again, just investing in building relationships, especially uh, it's interesting that's an organization where people usually tend to be in the client's office as opposed to the McKinsey office. Um, in Switzerland, the University of Zurich is trying something called a three to two week. So that's, you can pick any days of the week, three of those days you should be in the office, two days you should work from home and two days are dedicated you know, to time off, spending time with family and friends. Uh, and you can make those Monday or Tuesday, it could be your new weekend. Um, so really curious to see kind of how that shakes out in a year, how that's been going. And then Spotify has also adopted a policy. I think Twitter has done this as well, which is work from anywhere. So you can come into the office, but you're also free to be wherever you want. Um, and then sort of more broadly, it seems like these are some of the trends that we're seeing. So again, alternating weeks or days, uh, making sure that you're staying under capacity. So having people, you know, pick when they want to come in, flexible hours. This is something that my organization is considering, um, especially this is nice. So we are, our headquarters is in Mountain View, uh, but we've had people during the pandemic move to like East Bay, to San Francisco, a bit farther away. And those people still want to be in the office, but don't want to commute on the heavy traffic times. Um, so this is a, is a model that we're looking into. Um, so everyone would just you'd have some set hours, but people would be able to leave a little earlier and, and have an easier commute. <clears throat> and then finally, I think this one is super interesting too, the academic model. So you're supposed to be in the office two to three days a week. So you normally have like a flexible schedule, but there's still in-person time but two months out of the year, you can work totally remotely. And so a lot of organizations are thinking that might be over the holidays. Uh, so maybe December or January would be fully remote. And then a month in the summer too, when kids are off school. Um, so I think that's, there's, there's a lot, you can see there's a lot of different models out there. People are trying new things. So I think one of the big things is just kind of to keep keep an eye out for what, for what seems to be working and how these organizations adjust their plans over the next six months as they test them more. So we'd love to hear now what other work models you've seen as inspiration. Um, and feel free if you post in the chat, uh, share there, or you can also take yourself off mute. Um, if there's maybe your organization is thinking of something um, maybe you've already been having people come in part-time, uh, what that has looked like. We'd love to learn from each other. Especially because we know that so much of this is going to affect your planning around transportation um, and commuting. And so we're trying to give you all a sense of like as broadly as possible what the models are, knowing that you may or may not be in control of setting the models at your organization. but just thinking about how you and your colleagues might be, might have to respond to some of these models. So we know there's more out there. People are getting really creative about how and when to bring people back to the office. So anything you've uh, seen, or if you just want to share what, what your organization is planning or trying to decide between. Nicole says, if people have relocated out of area, maybe two consecutive days in office may be more feasible. Um, yes, agree. And then uh, Peter says, during pandemic, we had to do A-B schedule one weekend, one week remote for agreement union employees. Kim says, employees working remotely from Ecuador in the morning with ETO 12 to five to deal with the time change. Uh, Christine, your thoughts for industries where it's harder to work remote, like biotech labs. Um, so on the, yeah, I'm curious if other people have an answer to that of if they've seen or like what they've heard about in these companies where you still do have to go in. I know um, a couple of people who work at biotech companies and they've gone into the lab 
I think two to three days a week over the last couple months and you know with very limited capacity and then the work that they do from home they try to do there but um, they've been going in lab-based employees are in office lab as needed and working from home when they can says Maria yeah that's that's what I've observed as well great um, anything else, Molly, that you've seen? I know your organization also works with a bunch of other companies. Um, I know, I mean, I put all of my thoughts into the slides. <laughs> I gave you all of my different models that I've seen. I'm sure there's Amazing. more that exist and, you know, we're keeping our eye on them. Um, I think it'll be, and this goes to the second piece of this, like I think so much of what we're seeing right now is people starting to plan for what the model is gonna look like, knowing that like we are never gonna really know how it works until we try it, um, unless you've been doing it all along through the pandemic. So I'm sure there's gonna be shifts as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter, would like to see examples in heavily unionized workforce, successes with telecommute policies, especially in transportation space. Um, yeah, so as these comments are coming in in the chat, if any of you have examples you can share, um, feel free to type those out or unmute yourselves. Yeah, and on the unionized, um, yeah, please, please share. Um, you know, I think we're, we're starting to see examples of that in terms of teachers returning um, and different states are handling that differently, but um, with the unions that all has to be negotiated through them obviously with some teachers unions we're seeing um partial return so a couple days a week or reduced hours um and then also we're seeing that some unions are not mandating it so i know in new york city they there's been a choice given to teachers whether they want to return or not um and those teachers that don't want to return right now will continue teaching the remote classrooms and those teachers who do want to return will start teaching in-person classrooms and so of course that's like a mess because then they're like they actually have to like re um group classrooms um but very much it depends on the union negotiations and what they're willing to agree to in terms of what that return looks like great um, some services and tools that we've seen pop up to kind of aid, there's like a whole industry coming up now around flexible work. So WorkSphere uh, allows you to essentially, you have a dashboard and then you can figure out like, it's also nice you can set different capacity limits for different floors or different parts of your office and then have people book when they wanna come in, make sure that the right people are coming in at the right time so that they can collaborate and work on things together. Um, and it's also what's interesting is as you can be immediately responsive as local edicts change. So if suddenly there's a variant that comes out, knock on wood, hopefully not, uh, you can reduce capacity for the next day and say like, actually now we can only have 25% capacity as opposed to 75%. So that'll be another thing to watch out for too. And I think will heavily impact this is just how local regulations change. I mean, we've seen that in the Bay Area um, I know they've it kind of ebbed and flowed, especially in San Francisco. Uh, zero is a way for people to access their health status remotely, uh, make sure that when people come in, they don't have temperatures, you know, have them sort of fill out all the forms that they need to, uh, also sort of promoting safety for employees. And then SCEDA is also similar. So interactive floor plans um, and rule-based automations. So you can also there sort of update depending on how things are going COVID wise uh, and make sure that you are complying with local regulations um, and having you know not too many people in at the same time. I think it's interesting seeing all these services come up and it's sort of, yeah, it's, it, I, you know, there's still uncertainty too around the variants coming out. And so there's sort of the health concerns. There's like the will when what will work best in terms of having people collaborate and then also what can you legally allow that might change over the next couple months yeah this is just the skimming the surface there's so many more of these tools that have popped up um uh so we would love to have you share if there's any other tools that you've seen and 
And also to share too, if there's integrations with um, software that you already use for commute booking or commute planning, that sort of thing. You know, I, I think that a lot of these companies are trying to be like sort of the full stack or full suite of tools. So covering health, wellness, um, desk booking, capacity planning, knowing where personnel are, all of that. And it seems to me like the commute is the, um, the before and after, like the beginning and the end of that user journey. Um, so we'd love to see if there's other tools that you've seen um, that have started integrating commute or other tools that you're using um, related to COVID planning. And Christine asks, what about telepresence robots? I haven't seen anything on that. Um, I have heard certain places that I have heard that because people might still want to keep social distancing in offices, that most meetings would still require people, even if you're in the same office, to video conference in, um, just because you might not be able to stick like 10 people in a room like you used to be able to. Uh, so that's kind of the closest that I've heard to telepresence robots where it would kind of render them unnecessary if everyone is still calling into Zoom meetings and, and video calls. But yeah, if anyone else has examples, super curious to hear about that. Yeah, that's a big trend that we're seeing is organizations when they have their all hands meetings, their town hall, their big staff meetings, um, even when those used to happen in person. And even if like health, health concerns aside, they could happen in person. Um, the people are really liking having it be where each person calls in individually on their laptop as opposed to some people calling in on their laptops, some people being in a conference room together, some people being in another office location and different conference room. Like it makes it so much easier to hear, to understand, to see when everyone is just on their laptops. So we're starting to see that um, people continue to do that and even schedule some of those town hall days on the days when people will be more likely to be working remotely to make sure that that's easy to happen. Yeah, there's, a, there's one of the things at Humu that we're encouraging people to do is like if one person on your team is remote or working from home, kind of treating it as if everyone is. And so making sure that it's equitable and one way to do that is to just have everyone call in. So you're all having the same experiences. So if there's glitches, you're kind of all on deck to resolve those. Um, and then also just the importance of, you know, if you're a leader or, you know, if you have influence or can speak to leaders of having them call in as well. I think that really sets an example of we are embracing hybrid work. We're not, you know, I think what the leader does uh, kind of sets the tone. And so you want to make sure that calling in remotely or just calling into a meeting is, is not just tolerated. It's actually encouraged. Um, let's see, we have here uh, Barada shared. I've been in an org that had a robot where the majority were in office that worked for the two to three staff that were out of state but it could be unpredictable to use for impromptu use when you don't know who else is on site. Super fun, it brought a smile though. I would love to see a robot, It'd be interesting. Great, um, maybe we'll say one more time if anyone has anything else or any questions related to this. Otherwise, we'll move on to iterative planning mindset. Yeah, the, the last thing I'll say on this is, um, if you are a big enough, if, you, if you're working for a big enough organization, it might be worth having conversations with some of these um, software companies that I mentioned. So I just had a conversation with WorkSphere and they're new and they're adding features all the time. So if you're like, it would be really great if you could integrate with, you know, add a commute feature to this. Um, I think a lot of them are really open to having that conversation. Um, all right, so we're going to move on to the second half here in terms of iterative planning. And when we were thinking about planning, as I mentioned, um, I know from, you know, working with my clients and being um, uh, within organizational development at Rally, which is based in LA, that um, we're still having conversations all the time about what the model is going to look like when we go back. We're not planning to go back until after Labor Day. Um, but there's so much that's in flux. The founder has, his preference is to go back three days a week, but there's so many exceptions. We've surveyed the staff once, we're gonna survey the staff again, it's gonna change. 
we're going to phase into it. So it'll be like we go back September and then we have um, one day a week that we start with and then we might move to two days a week and then three days a week just to let people ease into that. And so there's just so much change. It is very hard to plan for even when you are internal to those conversations, um, let alone having to be reactive to that to think about um, the commute. So um, a couple of tools that I want to share with you, and a lot of this comes from the work that I did at IDEO, which is a um, design innovation firm, and we worked with a lot of clients around challenges like this one. How do we design systems and services in environments where things change all the time? So a couple of things to think about is when you're thinking about new models to do deep user research, and we're thinking about that both from an ethnographic and a quantitative perspective. Um, so when you're thinking about what's going to work, you know, maybe you actually go and do ride alongs with the people who are commuting or you go and stand outside of your buildings and talk to people who are coming and going. I know a little diff difficult in COVID, but um, you might be you might set up phone calls like whatever you can do to actually get in front of your users and understand at a deep level their needs, their routines, how they think those things are going to change. Um, super helpful. And then thinking about quantitative, um, sending out surveys. And important to note that you can send out a survey even if you are not going to take the exact um, outcome of that survey and do exactly what it says, right? So surveys can be helpful to surface concerns and questions and general preferences, but no one says you have to do exactly what majority rules because that may not be feasible. Um, but we do recommend sending out surveys early on, you know, a couple of suggested questions. Um, how many days a week do you expect to work in the office? What time do you expect to commute? What is going to make the commute easier? Are there any extenuating circumstances you're willing to share that might make the commute hard or scary? Uh, we are hearing that people are um, sometimes afraid of getting back on public transportation, even if they have been vaccinated. Um, so digging in a little bit more into this through through answering these questions. Um, again, you don't have to have your model set. You don't feel don't feel like you need to communicate out directly what the results are. This is just like more information. So we'd love to hear in the chat, um, and we're gonna have time at the end to discuss this in breakout groups, but we'd love to hear in the chat if you've done anything like this before. So if your organization has started doing surveys around what the return to office looks like or around what the commute's gonna look like, we'd love to hear what questions you've asked um, and how that was helpful for you. While those are coming in, and I can't see the chat, so Liz is going <laughs> to read them off for me. Um, thinking about doing a user journey and, and not forgetting about before and after. So this is a typical user journey we have. This is for um, you know working within uh, a restaurant, but um, thinking about not only the moment of commuting, but also before and after commuting. So. What are people doing when they're deciding when to come in? What mode of transportation to use to come in? What are they doing after the commute, whether that's arriving at work or arriving at home? Um, and, and fully thinking about how those moments have changed during COVID. So again, this is going to be helpful to do after you've done your more qualitative research so you can have a sense of what your users are going through. But just really understanding all of these moments, it can be a fun exercise to do as a group if you work with a group um, or just to model out yourself. Um, and then lastly, thinking about prototyping, um, iterating, refining. So um, this is a model that came from IDEO. Um, so when you're thinking about rolling out any sort of new services, changes to services, new plans, we have a tendency to think we have to figure it all out and then it has to be perfect and then we'll roll it out. <laughs> and that's like a really good instinct because it means you're trying to answer all your questions beforehand and you want to make it the best user experience and you want to make sure that there's no issues that come up. But unfortunately, what that does is you put so much time into the moments before launching the changes or changing the plans. Um, and then 
life happens and life is not messy. Life is messy. It's not neat. And especially during COVID, things change so often that then you're going to have to change the plan anyways. And it's just going to take that much longer because you've already put in so many stakes in the ground that you may need to change. Um, and also it may not feel great to the people receiving that because if it doesn't align perfectly with what their expectations were and it's being communicated as here it is, it's done. It's like, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Like that's not going to work for us or like, uh, like wish you had asked for our input about that or like wish we had had a chance to test that out. Um, and so it's this process of iterating. Um, and so creating prototypes, getting feedback on them, refining them, and then doing it again, if needed, before you do a rollout of this. So, you know, a, a little bit of a different example, but I worked on a project for um, a customer service call center. And we wanted to create a new team structure, but instead of rolling it out to the, all 400 people in the organization, we said, let's start with one team. So let's create this new, we wanted to create a pod of three people and have them sit next to each other. So we picked three people and we did that with them for two weeks. And we sat next to them and we watched them, we asked them questions and they gave us feedback. And we learned a lot, a lot, a lot. And then the next time it was like, okay, let's do that with 20 people. And then we're gonna learn from that. And then maybe we're gonna do it for the whole organization, but we're still gonna learn from that. So I, I share that to say, what are the ways that you can start testing some of this out with a, you know, yourself, one of your colleagues, a team of your colleagues, get feedback on it, refine it before you, you have to feel like you, you make it absolutely perfect. So let's talk about what a prototype is when we're thinking about services. So this is an example that IDEO did. IDEO was working with Lufthansa to help them redesign their um, business class seating. So not first class, um, not economy, but the sort of middle area, which like was really important to them, but sort of didn't get as much attention as the other two. Now, I'm not suggesting you do this, but this is like a really, really cool high fidelity prototype. So they actually built out this um, warehouse to be a plane um, with cardboard walls um, and then they brought in the actual plane seats and then they had people um, they invited people to come and spend like you know somewhere between two and five hours in this area <laughs> um, they, are, they were not in flight, obviously, but you know, still really mimicked the idea and they were serving meals and people um, were you know, thinking about how does the seat feel? How am I going to the bathroom? All of these things and, and got feedback on it. Um, this is expensive, but you know what? It was way less expensive than redesigning the whole floor plan of you know, the thousands of planes that they have in the air <laughs> and then realizing that there were some problems. Um, so we know you, you know you you absolutely could do a cardboard model of a bus or a bus stop or you know any of the the spaces within the commute journey, um, but it, it doesn't have to be that high fidelity. Um, so it can also be what we call paper prototypes or digital versions of paper prototypes. Um, so in this case, this was um, a project we did with some nurses thinking about how they prepared um, people in a pediatric ward to uh, return home. So um, sometimes it was after um, labor and delivery, sometimes it was after complications, like it, it, it varied. And there was a variety of steps that happened that the nurses worked on to make sure that this journey home was seamless and worked for the parents and the child. And this was a board that had these different moments of the journey on it. And then the conversations that we had with the nurses revealed a lot. So we said, here's the, all the moments, move these around so that you can say when you think they should happen in what order. Um, in some cases, maybe they don't have to happen so you can remove that off the board. What else would you add to this? Um, and getting, engaging them in a conversation that was using a prototype to help ground the conversation around this journey and what it looked like and how it could be improved. 
Um, so here's another example. Um, so this is uh, if you're if you're trying to design an app um, and you're trying to create a paper prototype for that. So this is just a, a long strip of paper with the different moments, the different screens that you might use on the app and then had um, like an iPhone paper version that you would slide over it and you'd have conversations and say, OK, so this is what the home screen might look like. Um, what would you do next? Where would you click? OK, you would click there. This is what you would see next and going through it and answering any questions. So what we're trying to do with these prototypes is take the sort of theoretical and make it more tangible. So in the case of, of commuting, you know, you could think about um, doing some really basic sketches. You don't have to be a good artist. Um, you can bring in clip art, you know, really doesn't matter. Um, and creating user journeys or creating new services or new plans and actually sharing them with people. So that could be digitally right now. You could send people uh, a Word document with some you know, user flows on it um, and have a phone conversation. Or like I said, if you want to get out in the field and do some testing, um, you could go to um, the nodes of transportation around commuting and have conversations with them, you know, maybe even think about designing a flyer for the different transportation options that you might have. You're not committing to doing any of them, which is saying, you know, we're thinking about these four different options. Here's a little brochure for what the four different options entail. Would love for you to look at this and give me feedback on on which of these four things um, would make sense to you. People love giving feedback, especially for things that really affect their life, like commuting. People really value being able to have a voice, and especially in such an in-depth way. Um, so I think you know, if there's any concern about, well, people want to do this. Am I interrupting them? Um, they they really do value it and appreciate it. I want to something in the chat that came up that I think is uh, useful for everyone to hear. Uh, Nicole said user journey is good. Nobody probably remembers this, but circa 2010-2011, commute.org gave passes for a free transit trip. Good incentive for people to record their user journey, especially since California is supposed to open up soon. And then Rebecca says commute.org still offers free transit trips um, and then posted a link. So that's a great uh, addition. Um, and one other tool that we use at Humu for this kind of research is called usertesting.com. So you can upload a screenshot or a web page and then have people record. You can kind of say who, what kind of person you would like to look at it and then have them record their thoughts out loud as they're looking at it. So that's also a, an option um, that we found really valuable. Great. Yeah, and please share, if, if you all have done things like this, please share resources that you found helpful um, around doing this research and, and testing it out in your um, areas. Super helpful. So you've gone through this cycle of planning and iterating and getting feedback, um, and you're ready to communicate some of what's changing or the new offerings. So when you're doing this, you want to make sure to present the change as an experiment. So I will give this example, which was at IDEO about four years ago. We wanted to get everyone using Slack. And people were vehemently opposed to this because it was really um, frightening to think about, like, well, I've used email my whole adult working life, and now you're asking me to use this other tool that I don't really understand how it works. Like, I don't want to do that. Um, and so we, we tried, we got, you know, we started like trying to give incentives for people to use it and all of that. Finally, we brought everyone together and we said, all we're asking is that you commit to trying to use this for a month. If we decide we don't like it after that, that's totally fine. We can have another conversation, but we want you to open the Slack app every day for a month. And that's where we're going to share announcements. Um, that's all. Just try using it for a month. And that helps people be like, OK, fine. It's not forever. If I don't like it, I don't need to use it. And of course, they ended up liking it. And we kept using it. Um, now I like very much regret that day because Slack has taken over our lives. And I'm like, let's just put that Pandora back in the box. Um, but at the time, we thought it was going to be really helpful. Um, but you can present the change as we're going to try this for a period of time. You want to time box it. So we're going to try this for a month. We're going to try this for three months. 
we will then ask her feedback again after that month or after those three months in this way. We're gonna send out a survey. We're gonna to talk to all of you individually. Um, we're gonna have feedback forms in all of the meeting rooms, whatever it is. Um, something about that helps us as humans. Change is really scary as humans. We don't like it. And so if we feel like it's something that we can like dip our toes in the water, it makes it easier. And it's also true that it will be an experiment because the environment around us is going to constantly be changing. So like, we can't tell you what the capacity will be in November for offices. So it may just have to change anyways. Um, highlight what people will gain from in-person time. So this is really more for like, um, if you are a leader who's trying to get people to go back into the office. And I think in this case, you may be highlighting what people will gain from the commute offerings that you are sharing. Um, there's always gonna be trade-offs. So people are never gonna be fully satisfied. They're gonna want you know, it to be different because everyone has different needs, but focusing on the gains um, that people are gonna get from whatever you're sharing. Um, and then involving stakeholders early and often. So I know that all of you work with lots of different stakeholders in your organizations and your cities and making sure that through that prototyping process, you have gone to all of those stakeholders for input so that they can feel like they were a part of this change and therefore they will back you up with this change and be aligned on the vision that you are creating. So it's, um, it's 11.45 Pacific. So what we wanted to do is take five minutes to send you all into breakout rooms. So the way this is gonna work, and I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen, is we're gonna automatically break you up into groups of three to four people. You're just gonna be sent there. Um, and uh, we would like you to answer the question and I'll put it in the chat. How will you take an iterative ap approach to planning? So we, I think this is something that you're really going to learn a lot about from the other people in your group. So you can share you know, your organization um, and then um, share what, what planning approaches you are taking. So just shared the um, question. Um, we'll bring you back at 11. 51 and then we'll answer a few questions um, and we'll give you a one minute warning too. All right, so I'm creating the breakout rooms and sending you all there. And you do have to click accept to go into the room on your screen. If you don't feel like going to a breakout room, you can hang back with us in this home room. There we go. Hi, Christine. How are you? Oh, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, I'm sorry I had to miss the very, very beginning, but uh, you guys recording it, right? Exactly. Yeah, you could just look at our website probably next right. week. I don't think yeah, that's missed. great. Yeah. Hi, Richard W. He's on mute. <laughs> oh. Well, if you feel like unmuting yourself, Richard, um, and joining the conversation, Christine and I would love to have you. But uh, Christine, did you have any thoughts about the question? So integrated planning, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, difficult. And I mean, I'm, I'm currently, you know, I mean, we are a small organization. So I think, I mean, definitely, you know, that makes a lot more sense for larger orgs. Right. Um, and definitely, you know, integrating facilities as well. Um, I mean, you know, I think the even before the pandemic, what I had seen, I mean, is that there were already like some efforts to try to integrate. I mean, even like something as simple as, uh, so as I used to, to work in consulting and uh, for environmental management systems and, you know, even something like as simple for facility managers to figure out the EV charging, um, station and and getting people to move <laughs> move their cars when they were 
charged and you know they had like various approaches that they were trying to add and some of them were like peer-to-peer -peer pressure and then they also used to have like this little big big it kind of like a beacon like you you whenever you go to a restaurant and you know you order well well i i guess you're in line for a table and then they would like burn. Oh, vibrating and like um, loud. Right, exactly. But I mean, so, you know, I mean, I'm not like intimately familiar with some of the tools that you guys presented. I mean, I, I agree. I mean, it, it makes a lot of uh, sense. I would say, I mean, over the, the last few years also, I mean, you know, when climate change started to become more prevalent, um, so definitely, you know, providers were starting to, to give uh, companies tools where they could report their employees commute and then it would also kind of uh, automatically convert in greenhouse gas emission oh, what, is, what is that tool oh is it... gosh i mean there are like several out there so i think an an early one i want to say may have been right share but like super early one like 2000 you know five or something i mean let me know and um, hmm. I mean, Right Amigos, the our our platform definitely counts. Yeah, so that's how much greenhouse yeah. gas they've saved. But I think you guys were a little bit later. But I mean, so yeah, um, I have to look. But even even just asking their employees, like at you know, if you're like you were mentioning facilities or HR, just surveying your employees about like alternative commuting what would you be willing to take, I think would say a lot, or would you be willing to carpool with your, with your office mate if you, you know, if you could go, if we, if we had more flexible work schedules that allowed you to leave um, at a later time to avoid peak hour commuting. Yeah. Like, to kind of, to ask them like what trade-offs they would be willing to accept. Yeah, that's I think that's just, yeah, that's a good point. And I mean, it's kind of like tough, right? Because you're balancing everyone's individual, um, I don't know, need or desire for flexibility. And then, I mean, people still have to kind of like work together, right? To to make the adjustments. Um, yeah, I wonder it really, if- It really does seem across the board, like, I, I do know a lot of reports I've read like that 75% of employees want a two to three day work week. Like I see, I see that across the board, but it's just interesting to see how companies are going to, if they're going to accept that desire or, you know, or not. And will they do it? Uh, temporarily or will they do it for the long run are they going to pilot this program or okay it's just, i'm really curious to see if these large employers how much they're actually listening to their employees and what they want yeah that's a good point and i guess also in terms of you know measuring productivity mm -hmm. i mean how to how to go about that um <laughs> and yeah you're right because I mean, a lot of the larger companies, they they have those numbers about productivity, but the smaller ones just, they don't have metrics to study that or not. Yeah, it's... Will it be, will it be something you have to earn, you know, and earning a flexible work schedule? <laughs> that, that's true, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm curious, too. I think it really has to do with um, management style and what the management and what the executives are comfortable with. Yeah, and I think size too, probably, Rebecca, because oh, yeah, that's... Like the, the small and medium ones, I, I'm thinking, you know, that may be harder, right? Because you to, um, just they just sure don't have as many resources. The HR right. person does like seven different jobs. So yeah, that's a that's good point. <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. I'll, I'll see you in the in the main hall. Sounds nice good. to talk good with to you. you. Bye. Bye. Um, you're not going to please everyone. So, you know, I think, you know, using the phrase iterative, that's important. I think 
you know, being flexible um, with your option, um, you know, I, I guess to some degree, you're not going to cave into each and every demand because I think people unfortunately will take advantage of some situations. And um, I don't know if it's not necessarily for this form, but, you know, measurement tools is going to be at some point a bigger conversation for the telecommute world. You know, how do we measure that someone is as productive, um, you know, and how do you measure that across other uh, operating or administrative departments in your company? Um, and that's a difficult challenge um, because someone will, you know, may just argue, I just work better. I don't want to do my two hour commute, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, I don't want to come in, you know, whether it's one day a week, once a month. So um, it's, it's yeah. a challenge no matter what industry or sector that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for um, sharing with your groups. So we have about five minutes left and we are happy to answer any questions um, that we did not cover earlier. So feel free to come off mute or put it in the chat or if there are things that came up in your groups that you feel like would be valuable to share with the whole group, we would love to hear that as well. Molly, Liz, Peter, um, Peter again, just out of curiosity, have you seen any KPI um, from any companies that, you know, have found that telecommute is, is really working for them and they've been able to justify it? Yeah, so um, there's, I think there are, there are definitely, there's definitely data that people are more productive at home. So that's, um, <laughs> it's like when we think about why people are so burnt out right now, it's like because people are working harder than they potentially were in the office. Now, why that is and like for what companies is where that gets a little more difficult. So part of it is just like there's in some cases, you know, if you have kids at home, that's different. But in some cases, just fewer distractions. Um, so you can fit in more meetings, you're taking fewer breaks, you're taking out that commute time. And so like the hours spent like actually typing at your computer, if that's the type of work you're doing, has gone up. Now, whether that is just sort of busy work or there is some sort of additional cost to that because like you have to be sending more emails because you're missing out on in-person meetings, it's so hard for companies to tell. Um, I think there are companies who have found it to be great and they're going to continue with the all remote models, but I would say the majority of companies want to go back to the hybrid model because they do see in terms of their own internal performance indicators value, whether that's like actual just output, but also just like happiness, culture building, all of these things that can happen much better um, in person. I don't know, Liz, yeah, what we numbers. Yeah, what we saw um, across organizations at Humu was that there was actually a big spike in productivity once COVID hit, uh, but it seemed like that went down as time went on. And it seems like that was partially because people were just so anxious about their jobs because unemployment hit record highs. And so it's kind of what Molly was saying, where you saw this big boost in productivity. And at the same time, like three months later, six months later, and now you're seeing just like enormous drops in well being um, and increases in burnout. So I think what we're hearing from executives, leaders, and managers is like, I just feel like I've lost one of my senses. So I need to do so much more work because I just don't have a pulse on how people are going. I can't doing, I can't just stop by. I have all these meetings. We've seen that like off hours messaging and emails and meetings have gone up. Uh, I think meetings on the weekends or like work that people are doing on the weekends has tripled. Um, so there's definitely a cost to all of this. And then what we're hearing from employees now is, I'm doing the work, but without any of the fun. So all of the pieces that were like you had in the office or even, I remember my commute was really fun after work because we would all get on Caltrain together. And, you know, it was just like kind of a, we would have like just socializing time or time to talk about work. Um, so yeah, I think, I think a lot of the data that we've seen around productivity in the last year is an anomaly because of all these external forces. So it'll be interesting to see how that shapes up. Um, in the future. 
Mark in the chat points out a large benefit is also regarding potential reduction in greenhouse gases. And yeah, I think this has been something we've also seen leaders start to think about is like, what is sort of their social responsibility as a company as climate change gets worse and worse and how can hybrid work fit into that? Um, and then there was a question, does anyone have data on the percentage of people who will telecommute or work remotely in the future? So I know in the US, uh, I think the percentage of people working from home during COVID went from 2% to 50%. Um, so I would expect that a big chunk of that 50% will, will adopt some kind of high, hybrid model. Um, and I think I've seen estimates that maybe like 10% will be fully remote still. Um, but I think again, no one knows. <laughs> so I think those are sort of estimates. Uh, and to Molly's point, I think this, even those numbers, I'm sure will be iterated upon as differences show up. One last thing that I found interesting is, um, I don't remember what company it was, but there was an organization that asked people, how many of you want to work remotely full time? And they asked this last summer, and so like 75% of people said they would want to keep working remotely full time. And then they did the same survey two months ago and that number had dropped to 30%. So it seemed like over the course of a year, people really started to want to go back to the office. Um, so I think, I think people also don't even really know what it's like. We've all forgotten what it's like to be in an office. And I think people will have different responses even once that starts happening. Um, we are at time. Um... And thanks for sharing that in the chat, Alex. Um, really appreciate all of the participation and resources that you all shared. Um, really wish you the best. You all are doing important work and we thank you for it. And enjoy the next two days of this. We'll hand it back to Murata if there's anything else. Hey, thank you all. And thank you for your participation. I think some takeaways that I remember from Molly and Liz, what you shared is um, really, being intentional about research and, and also, you know, like taking the deep dive into research sometimes and, and doing it iteratively can help um, really set expectations um, and also um, set a new tone. Because I think, I, I think even from the last question that we got in the chat is, yeah, this is unknown and, you know, change is scary, the unknown is scary. And so, a lot of times we want research and data almost for the comfort of it. <laughs> um, but even, even with the comfort of it, um, the iterative mindset is that um, we will still have many repetitions and a lot of, um, it, it, it really isn't ever like this complete package, okay, and we've done and we're landed. <laughs> um, so I really take that away from what you shared with an iterative mindset. And we are gonna continue these conversations um, tomorrow, taking a, a harder look at, at what how our spaces define our workplace and how that will affect our commuting. So Liz and Molly, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for, um, for joining our uh, presentation today and look forward to having you join um, the next two days as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.